I'm covering the second chapter. Second chapter is about how people get um, addicted to drugs and why they get addicted to drugs. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Maybe. There we go. Psychoactive drugs are substances that directly affect the central nervous system. The method that a drug gets into the brain are called pharmacokinetics, literally drug movement. Uh, this includes uh, how they absorb uh, into the system, how they're distributed throughout, uh, throughout your body, how they're metabolized out of your body, and how they're eliminated from your body. Now all of this has to take place no matter whether you're smoking pot or taking or smoking crack, um, uh, shooting up with heroin. All this stuff has to, to be um, taken into the body. It, it spreads throughout the body. It uh, eventually is broken down because it's a to they are toxins and it has to be eliminated from the body. Now this can be a really serious problem, especially if we're talking about methamphetamines. So pharmacokinetics have to do with the route of, of administration. Uh, this little this lady is uh, doing what they refer to as chasing the dragon. Uh, she has raw opium there, and she's sucking it uh, through that tube. She's heating it and sucking it through the tube to get high. Uh, pharmacokinetics have to do with the speed of, of transit to the brain, and we're going to talk about how fast uh, drugs get into your system. Uh, the fastest way, of course, is to breathe it in, because if you take it down into your lungs, then you have all that surface area inside your lungs uh, that allow it to get into your, your system very rapidly. Uh, the affinity for nerve cells and neurotransmitters. Uh, what does it affect? Um, a good example is uh, caffeine. So, um, I'm not sensitive to caffeine. Some people are very sensitive to caffeine. I have a brother uh, who uh, can't, can't drink coffee. He uh, can't even drink a Mountain Dew. And the reason he can't is because he's so sensitive to caffeine. But I can drink it all day long and it doesn't affect me at all. I can drink it right before I go to bed. It doesn't keep me awake. It, it doesn't do anything to me. It doesn't wake me up. It doesn't do anything to me. So we have different biochemistry, my brother and I. Uh, when a psychoactive drug can get to, uh, to its target in the central nervous system rapidly, the more addictive it tends to be. Inhaling, when a person smokes a psychoactive substance or draws it in as a vapor, as with nitrous oxide or inhaling an active chemical solvent, Colloquial refer, colloquially referred to as huffing, the drug enters the individual's lungs. The drug is rapidly absorbed through the capillary lining of the alveoli of the bronchii. And this is a picture of two boys who were huffing. The psychoactive substance travels through the body with the blood and is pumped uh, to the brain and the tissues of the body and may reach the brain in as short as 7 to 10 seconds. Inhaling is the most rapid method of getting a psychoactive substance into the system. Individuals are able to control levels and reactions of the psychoactive substance, known as titration, by regulating the frequency of use and the depth of inhalation. Uh, this is why most tobacco smokers spend more time holding their cigarettes than actually puffing them. Since smoking is an inefficient uh, means of administering the psychoactive properties in marijuana, uh, and of course the psychoactive uh, property is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol, sixty percent of the substance is lost. Pharmaceutical companies are working on aerosol and nasal sprays to deliver the THC. And these are known as marinol and dronabinol. Uh, this method would also eliminate the tars and other toxic substances that make marijuana carcinogenic. Injecting is uh, where the individual introduces the psychoactive substance into the body by using a hypodermic needle and a syringe. There are three methods of injecting appropriate psychoactive substances into the body. Uh, intravenous, uh, into the vein, uh, colloquially known as slamming, is where the psychoactive substance is injected directly into the bloodstream. 
Uh, this method delivers a psychoactive substance through the bloodstream into the brain in 15 to 30 seconds. This method is the most likely to create a head rush, an intense feeling of excitation and mental electricity. Intramuscular into the muscle, colloquially referred to as muscling, uh, the psychoactive substance is injected directly into the muscle. Um, of course, if you're, if you're using intravenous, you have to be able to hit a, a vein. Uh, and if you're doing it by yourself, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Intramuscular, and the reason I know that is because I've drawn my own blood. I'm not saying I've ever shot up with anything, but I've, uh, I've drawn my own blood. Intramuscular, a lot easier. You, it's easy to hit a muscle with a, with a needle. Uh, colloquially known as muscling, the psychoactive substance is injected directly into the muscle. Uh, this method of introducing psychoactive substances through the bloodstream and into the brain uh, takes about three to five minutes. This method will not create a head rush, but a slower buildup of euphoria. Subcutaneous, uh, under the skin, uh, colloquially referred to as skin popping. Uh, the psychoactive substance is injected directly under the skin. This method of introducing psychoactive substances through the bloodstream and into the brain in three to five minutes. This method will not create a head rush, but a slower buildup of euphoria. And these scars are uh, very... Um, mm -hmm. Accurate. The, the, this is what it really looks like. Uh, I had a friend um, when I was working at another on another reservation up in Montana, and he was a skin popper. And by golly, he had these things all over his arms, both arms, uh, because that's what he did. He would uh, uh, take a needle and whatever he was using. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was crystal meth. Uh, he was he was injecting it underneath the skin and and uh, and then uh, in injecting it. And what it did, it, it caused uh, blisters. It blisters up and, and uh, uh, he had these circular scars all over his arms, both arms. Never saw his legs, but I'm sure they were there too. There you go, skin popping. That's what it looks like. And these are the what it looks like when they blister up. Yeah, pretty ugly stuff. Injection is the most dangerous method of introducing drugs into the body because once they are entered, there is no turning back. Injecting also in, in, introduces the user to a whole host of contaminating uh, infections such as hepatitis B and C, syphilis, and HIV. Now, interestingly, uh, when, I, when I first started in medicine, uh, it was in the 1970s, early 1970s, and uh, hepatitis B and C, there was, there was no cure for hepatitis C at the time. Uh, HIV didn't exist yet, or we yeah. hadn't seen it yet. Uh, so what we were really looking for was syphilis. Uh, that's what everybody was afraid of. Everybody was afraid of, of uh, uh, developing syphilis. The individual is also more prone to abscesses and embolisms. Uh, an embolism is a blood clot. And, of course, this, this guy theoretically is dead, but you can tell by his skin tone he's not really dead. It's, he just looks dead from his face. Mucous membrane absorption. Uh, select psychoactive substances that come in uh, a powdered form can be inhaled through the nose and absorbed in the capillaries found in the mucous membrane. This is You can do this with cocaine. You can do it with heroin. Uh, with methamphetamine, and you can you can grind up uh, any of the pills. OxyContin is a is a good example. This method is much more rapid than oral ingestion and bypasses most of the body's defenses, uh, digestive acids, enzymes, and the liver. Uh, besides snorting uh, through the nose, there are two other uh, methods used: buccally between the gums and cheek, like. Uh, uh, snuff or snooze, and sublingually under the tongue, sublingual under the tongue. Uh, there is a medication that you have to take under your tongues. I'm trying to think what it is. Uh, uh, wait a minute. It's a stuff that they blow up, TNT. Um, ah, my brain's not working this morning. 
or this evening, this afternoon. <laughs> anyway, you got to put it under your tongue. They use it for heart attacks. It slows everything down. Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, thank you. My wife just gave me the answer, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Absorbing drugs through the mucous membrane in the rectum and the vagina are also possible. This is usually administered as a suppository. It can also be used for recreational drugs such as ketamine and cocaine. Uh, there are interesting, we have seen these in the emergency room. You see this stuff in the emergency room uh, from time to time. People will get things stuck in their rectum or uh, people will come in really drunk um, and uh, with their uh, vagina inflamed because they have uh, soaked a tampon in alcohol and put it up inside their uh, inside their vagina and of course it's absorbed the alcohol and they've been drinking alcohol at the same time and they get really 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 drunk uh, and, all, and you've got to understand that alcohol is a, a toxin um, and if you do this and uh, it, it uh, is next to your mucous membrane for an extended length of time, it will, it will cause a raw place. And that's usually what you're dealing with here. Uh, this individual uh, took an aerosol can and he uh, uh, shoved it up inside his rectum. For whatever reason, you, strange things. You see people do strange, strange things in the emergency room. Not in the emergency room, but <laughs> they come into the emergency room because they've done some strange things. Gerbils, snakes, uh, I'll tell you what. Light bulbs, oh my goodness gracious, people are so strange. Oral ingestion, when a drug is swallowed, it goes through the esophagus into the stomach. It passes into the small intestine where it is absorbed by the capillaries and the mucosal lining of the intestine. This method requires between 20 to 30 minutes before the drug begins affecting the brain. And this is one of the reasons why if you take an aspirin uh, and you think, oh, geez, I've got a headache, I need to take care of it right away, and you take your aspirin and all of a sudden it goes away, well, that's it should take 20 to 30 minutes for that to absorb in your stomach and get into uh, your small intestines where it can be uh, distributed throughout your body. So if you're you're getting an instant relief from something, uh, it's probably a placebo, it's as strange as that may seem. So the reality is, and I do this when I when I eat when I <laughs> when I lift weights, I I uh, I need protein, um, but I have to wait for two hours for my stomach to empty. Uh, so I'll eat eggs in the morning and. Uh, and I'll, I will allow it to uh, get uh, into my system uh, before I, I go and lift because I need the protein uh, to build muscle. So it's just something to think about. If you're getting instant relief from something, it's probably a placebo. <clears throat> if the psychoactive substance is a beer or other alcoholic beverages, about 10 to 20 percent of the substance will be metabolized by the stomach. Males tend to metabolize alcohol faster than women, and thus they get drunk slower than a woman who consumes the same amount of liquor. And what we're talking about is alcohol dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme in the stomach that men have a lot more of than women do. And for that reason, of course, males don't get drunk as fast as females do, which isn't absolute, of course. You know, it really all depends on their biochemistry. But most men have more uh, alcohol dehydrogenase than, than women do. Most psychoactive substances are fat-soluble, and so they move re uh, readily across the membranes. Alcohol is both fat and water-soluble. Transdermal absorption. Uh, drugs are now being impregnated on adhesive patches so that the medication can be slowly absorbed through the skin. Some of these patches provide medication for up to seven days, though it may take as long as two days before a therapeutic level of the drug makes it into your system. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, that, yeah, a lot of transdermal patches. Um, caffeine, not caffeine, what am I thinking of? Nicotine, they have nicotine patches, and that's how they work, transdermal absorption. 
Because of various factors, psychoactive substances in the blood do not remain in the system for the same length of time. This is known as bioavailability. There are various factors that restrict the availability of the psychoactive substance to the target tissue after administration. Once a psychoactive substance enters the bloodstream, it can be transported. It's either transported inside blood cells, it can be transported in the plasma, it can, be, uh, it can attach itself to a protein molecule and be uh, transported that way. So it can either be, uh, it can attach itself to blood, uh, just float around in the plasma, or attach itself to protein molecules. The psychoactive substance, substance will visit every organ in the body where it will either cause an effect, it will be ignored by the organ, it will be stored usually in fat cells, or it will be uh, biotransformed, broken down into chemical variations that may or may not cause psychoactive effects. It really all depends on what the drug is and what organ it's going through. While the chemical structure of the drug is a factor in distribution, so is the size of the individual. A lighter person with less blood volume will uh, have less blood to dilute the chemical. The blood volume of an adult is 6 to 8 quarts of blood. For children, it's only 3 to 4 quarts, and that's the reason why children's doses are sometimes half of what an adult's dose will be. But that's not an absolute, so you've got to be really careful when you're de dealing with uh, children in medication. Uh, you can uh, overdose them very, very easily, and that's one of the reasons why we have pediatricians who specialize in children. It's, they're the ones that understand these things. Organs with extensive vascularization will be affected by a drug to a greater, uh, greater degree. This is one of the reasons why cocaine can cause fatal heart reactions. Too much of the drug affects the highly vascularized heart, causing uh, the heart to arrest. Humans would have died from bacteria, viruses, and toxins at the beginning of our evolution if it weren't for our ability to keep most of these substances out of our central nervous system. The walls of the capillaries that feed the nervous system consist of tightly sealed epithelial cells that only allow certain substances to penetrate. This is known as the blood-brain barrier. And without the blood-brain barrier, we'd all be dead a long time ago. We, we would not have evolved to the point that we have evolved. Luckily for those who need a chemical assistance in, uh, on their lucidity, psychotropic medications do cross the brain-blood barrier and change ser uh, serotonin, GABA, or, or whatever uh, neurotransmitter to reduce the symptoms of depression, anxiety, or whatever. The chemicals that people use as psychoactive substances also across the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, they wouldn't be taken since there wouldn't be a brain reaction to them. And of course, this is Amy Winehouse, uh, who is, uh, this is a picture of her when she was stoned on marijuana. And you can see how <laughs> out of it she is. The reason psychoactive substances cross the blood-brain barrier is because the brain is very fatty. And most psychoactive substances are fat-soluble or lipophilic. Lipophilic means fat-soluble. Uh, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, these are three examples of um, uh, highly lipophilic uh, substances. Um, how long does it take to, uh, uh, to get into the system? How long does it take to get it out of the system is, is the question. And one of the reasons we ask this question is because um, sometimes people want to know whether you have a drug in your system. So they will uh, do a urine test on you. Uh, and um, that was one of my jobs when I was in the service, was collecting drug urines on people. Uh, and this is really what we were looking for. Uh, if somebody had um, used a, dr a drug uh, within a cert select amount of time, we would uh, discover it and, of course, we would... Uh, not kick him out of the service. Usually we treated him and we gave him another chance. <laughs> That's normally what happened. So as far as amphetamines are concerned, it's usually detectable 
in urine for two to four days, uh, barbiturates four to seven days, uh, benzodiazepines three to seven days, cocaine two to four days, ecstasy one to three days, uh, methadone, which is a form of, uh, of op it's an opiate, uh, three to five days, methamphetamine, another amphetamine, uh, three to five days, uh, most opiates, two to four days, um, phenocyclidine, PCP, uh, seven to 14 days, THC stays in your system the longest, 15 to 30 days, that's a month, that's a whole month, and it, the reason is because it's so lipophilic, uh, if you smoke uh, pot and you smoke it every day, it gets into your fat in your body and it is still detectable in your urine for an extended length of time because it is stuck in your fat. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, tricyclics uh, 7 to 10 days, uh, propoxyphene uh, 1 to 2 days, oxycodone 2 to 4 days, amphetamines 2 to 4 days, cocaine, oh we've already done all those, okay. The drugs that are completely fat soluble will cross the brain blood barrier very rapidly. Drugs that are only partially fat soluble will cross the barrier much slower. This is the case with morphine, which crosses the barrier much slower than heroin does. This form of crossing the barrier is known as passive transport. Active transportation takes place when a water soluble or hydrophilic chemical needs to cross the blood brain barrier. A water soluble chemical must first attach itself to a chemical structure that will readily cross the barrier. In the case of cocaine, cocaine hydrochloride attaches itself to protein molecules. Most water-soluble substances, such as antibiotics, will not cross the, the barrier. The blood-brain barrier does not completely develop until the individual is one or two years old. This is really important because that fetus uh, inside a, a mother uh, its brain is taking in anything that she's taking in. There is no blood-brain barrier. This doesn't develop until they're older. Toxic chemicals that will not injure it, adults cross an infant's barrier and cause brain, can cause brain damage. The placental barrier protects the developing fetus from water-soluble chemicals, but since most psychoactive substances are fat-soluble, the fetus uses whatever the mother uses. And this is something to remember. <clears throat> I have a niece, a great niece, she's my great niece, uh, who shot up with heroin while she was pregnant with her, with her son. Um, it, it's, it's an ugly, ugly story, but, uh, and, and the whole time, of course, the baby was using when she was using. It took them six weeks to get, the, uh, after the kid was born, uh, to uh, get him uh, off of heroin to clean him up, just to, uh, to soak it out of his system. The body is always trying to rid itself of foreign substances, whether they are harmful or helpful. It does this in two ways, metabolism uh, and excretion. Metabolism is where they process using and inactivating a substance. Most of this takes place in the liver. It processes, uses, and inactivates the substance. That's why if you drink too much, uh, you kill liver cells because you're forcing them to work over, uh, you're, you're overloading them. And of course, that can be a problem. If you work in a toxic environment where you're breathing in uh, negative chemicals all the time, toxic chemicals, you can get the same reaction from your liver. So anytime you're overloading your liver, um, with uh, some toxic substance, such as drugs or, or alcohol, uh, then you're killing your liver cells. Uh, the other way is through excretion, expelling the foreign substance and its metabolites from the body. This takes place mostly in the kidneys. So the liver and the kidneys are the way you get rid of this, these toxins. When the liver... When the liver metabolizes alcohol, it breaks it down into water and carbon dioxide and excretes it from the body through the urinary tract, sweat, and as vapor from the lungs. And if you've ever been around somebody that was drunk, and even if they weren't breathing on you, you could still smell the alcohol in their sweat. Uh, 
working in the emergency room, I'll tell you why. We, <laughs> you could usually tell if somebody, uh, if somebody had been drinking uh, to excess uh, because it was in their sweat, and of course it's in their breath as well. Uh, the liver breaks val uh, Valium into four metabolites that are actually active in themselves and affect the brain. This is uh, Lindsay Lohan uh, when she was still drinking. Uh, she's she's got a lot of problems. I guess she I guess she's cleaned up a little bit, uh, but her mother was an alcoholic, strangely enough. So there you go. A measurement of the metabolism or elimination of a chemical is the half life. It takes six half lives to break a chemical down so that it isn't detectable. Cocaine uh, starts to have its half life only lasts 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, it can be detectable for three to six hours. Methadone, 15 to 60 hours uh, for, for its half life, is detectable up to 15 days. THC, 20 to 30 hours, it's detectable for five to seven and a half days. Prozac, one to six days, detectable for six to 36 days. Clearing the system is based on many factors, so none of these uh, figures are absolutes. We're going to talk about some of the factors right now. Age. Age is a factor in metabolism of drugs. After the age of 30, the liver begins producing fewer and fewer enzymes to metabolize select chemicals such as alcohol and the sedative hypnotic drugs. 30. That's 30. I'm 73. <laughs> <laughs> so all of this starts starts taking place when you're old. Race has been shown to be a factor in levels of uh, types of enzymes maintained in the liver. Caucasians tend to maintain enzymes used to metabolize alcohol rapidly, while Asians metabolize alcohol slower and with more side effects, quicker drunkenness, and a rapid uh, flushing of the face. And if you've ever been around somebody... Uh, who is Asian while they were drinking alcohol. You know, after the first beer, uh, their cheeks are pretty rosy. <laughs> and Caucasians, of course, you don't see the same thing. Hereditary uh, factors can uh, affect metabolism. The one thing that we need to know about Caucasians, um, uh, Europeans, Europeans, that's where alcohol came from. Alcohol came from Europe. Uh, they, it was hardly ever used in Asia. It certainly wasn't used in the Americas. Uh, so uh, Europeans uh, have uh, are professional drinkers, uh, and they're professional drinkers because of heredity. They, uh, you know, they've they've had uh, thousands and thousands of years to uh, weed out the uh, the weak uh, links in uh, in alcohol. So. Uh, to almost to an individual, uh, Caucasians are much better at metabolizing alcohol from their system uh, than uh, people of Asian descent or African descent uh, or any of the other races. Uh, some people inherit uh, fewer enzymes. Some people inherit more body fat to, to uh, store drugs. Uh, some people inherit a high me metabolic rate to uh, help eliminate drugs. If you've ever been around somebody that was a, a, a chronic alcoholic, uh, you know that some of them are really skinny. Some of them are really big, but but some of them are just skinny as minutes. They have no body fat whatsoever, and you wonder, how do they do that? How in the world can they possibly be an alcoholic when they're so small, so skinny? And the answer is they have a high me metabolic rate. So they burn, uh, they burn calories very rapidly. Health can affect metabolism. Unhealthy people tend to metabolize chemicals slower or less completely. Uh, for example, the individual may have severe liver damage due to hepatitis or cirrhosis, and this individual will get drunk more, uh, much quicker. An individual's emotional state changes the effects of a drug. Uh, anger or anxiety in a person using methamphetamines may cause episodes of lashing out or violence. The presence of other drugs will delay the metabolism of select drugs. When alcohol is used with Xanax, and Xanax will, Xanax will stay in the body two to three times longer than normal. Uh, this delay of metabolism and exaggeration of effects is called drug 
synergism. And this is one of the things that you have to look for uh, when you're talking about uh, different drugs. Not everyone's body chemistry is the same. This is why some people are allergic to select drugs and others aren't. Uh, some people lack the enzyme that metabolizes cocaine, so even a small amount in the system will result in an exaggerated reaction and even death. Um, these are select individuals. I am not sensitive to opiates. Um, it do, it doesn't take pain away. It doesn't do anything to me. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why when I had a heart attack, they kept wanting to give me uh, uh, morphine for the pain, and I, I wasn't in that much pain for one thing. Um, and I wouldn't let him give it to me because I was afraid it might lock up my bowels. But it wasn't going to take the pain away. It didn't do anything for the pain. Other factors that can affect the metabolism of a psychoactive drug, your weight, uh, level of tolerance that you have, a monthly hormonal cycle of a woman, uh, enzyme induction, enzyme inhibition, and the weather. Uh, so when is a woman uh, the most susceptible to drugs? She's the most susceptible to drugs uh, in between uh, her period. Uh, so uh, it's not when she's ovulating. It's, uh, it's, it's when if somebody has PMS, that's when they have, uh, that's when they're most susceptible to drugs. In order to understand the effects of psychoactive substances uh, have on the nervous system in general, and the central nervous system in particular, we need to review the various nervous systems that control our bodies. The nervous system can be divided into two basic parts. The central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal column and controls most nervous responses, and the peripheral nervous system, which encompasses all other nerves outside the central nervous system and communicates impulses to the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system collects information, sends it to the central nervous system, which then responds to the stimulus back through the peripheral nervous system. The proper response will be through a, the appropriate system of the body, and these are the systems of the body. The nervous system, the skeletal system, the endocrine system, the digestive system, the respiratory system, uh, the muscular system, the circulatory system, the urinary system, the lymphatic system, and then integumentary system. Integumentary means the skin. Lymphatic means is, is a lymphatic system. It's, uh, it's not in the um, circulatory system. It doesn't have anything to do with blood cells. Well, it passes substances uh, through the circulatory system, but it's in between uh, organs. That's where your lymph, your in your lymph nodes and whatnot. That is that's where your lymphatic system is. Psychoactive drugs may alter information headed for the brain. Painkillers block the chemicals that tell the brain that they are in pain. Psychoactive drugs can disrupt messages sent back to the parts of the body when someone is so drunk that their hands and their feet don't work properly. Psychoactive drugs can disrupt thinking, or alcohol again. Psychoactive drugs may uh, affect an organ uh, when they pass through it, or affect them when the, the central nervous system sends back a distorted message. Evolutionary psychologists speculate that any changes to the human form, including the brain, continued because they assisted the individual in their survival. A good example of this is the human affinity for sugar and fat, which provides a quick and more prolonged energy source. Another example would be the affinity for sexual intercourse for both males and females, which led to offspring which uh, guaranteed the survival of the species. Following the evolutionary premise, psychoactive substances must serve some purpose. Some reason may be that, uh, one reason may be that, that uh, most psychoactive substances affect are natural survival mechanisms, but initially they cause desirable effects. Eventually, as humans, we may adapt to the effect of these substances, but as for now, these substances are subverting our survival mechanisms, and in many cases, the result is anti-survival. Um, an example, I may, may be somewhere else on the evolutionary scale, since, since opiates do not work on me. You know, this is something that's destructive for most people, but it doesn't do anything to me. 
The human brain not only maintains the largest cerebrum, the new brain, of all uh, creatures, but all the structures of the lower animals, the old brain. As survival became more complex, higher animals' forms developed new brain structures to aid them with survival. The primitive primal or old brain consists of the brainstem, the cerebellum, the midbrain or mesocortex, and the limbic system. These brain structures can be found from animals as primitive as fish to humans. And there you go. That's this portion right here. That's the part the the old brain and including the cerebellum it's right there. That's the old brain. <clears throat> this is the brain stem right here. That structure right there. And this is the limbic system. There's a cerebellum. Midbrain's right there. The old brain regulates physiological functions. Respiration is uh, regulated by the brain stem. Uh, heartbeat, which is also regulated by the brain stem. Body temperature by the brain stem once again. Uh, hormone release is, is controlled by the uh, hypothalamus and the pituitary. And that's this structure right here. Uh, and movement, which is controlled by the cerebellum. And there's a cerebellum right there. So most, most of these things are controlled by the brain stem. Okay, so, uh, so somebody goes into a coma. Let's say that somebody falls off the back of a motorcycle and goes into a coma. One of the reasons they do is because your skull is right here. And when you fall off the back of a motorcycle, your neck can't hold up your head because your head's so heavy and your neck is so weak. Uh, and uh, when you hit the back of your head, the skull cuts into your, your brain stem. And it bruises it or it cuts it, it damages it. Uh, and if that happens, of course, you'll, not only, you'll uh, go into a coma and uh, potentially you'll become a quadriplegic. The old brain, the limbic system, is the area that acknowledges the, ex the experience of basic emotions and cravings. Fear, anger, hunger, thirst, lust, pain, and pleasure. The old brain is the area that imprints survival memories, specifically the limbic system. Most, most psychoactive substances act on the old brain, causing euphoria in this area, and thus providing the euphoric memories that lead to addiction. The emotions of the old brain overpower the reasoning capacity of the cere uh, cerebrum and lead to the repeated taking of euphoric substances. As hominids advanced over time, more and more brain power was needed to survive. This came to us in the form of the cerebrum and the highly convoluted neocortex. The new brain aids us in solving the problems of survival. Neocortex is the whole surface of the brain. Most of the time, the new brain controls the old brain. Reasoning trumps emotion. However, when a person uses psychoactive substances, the craving from the old brain may override rational arguments. Uh, and these arguments may be, it's too expensive, there are bad side effects, it's dangerous, I have other responsibilities that are more important than my pleasure. These are the arguments, and it overrides that because it feels so good. The reward reinforcement pathway encourages a human to perform or repeat an action that promotes survival. It is this pathway that is affected by psychoactive substances. Also referred to as the mesolimbic uh, dopaminergic re reward pathway, it has a stop switch, and that is the orbitofrontal cortex, and a, more, and a more switch. This is the orbitofrontal cortex right here. This is the part that has to tell your brain to stop it. This is stupid. The more area is also known as the pleasure center and encompasses four structures. The amygdala, the lateral hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens septi, and the ventral tegmental area. So it's these four areas right here. These four areas right here. And this is the pleasure center. 
And here's the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, and this has to tell these four structures to stop it, that this is not, this is not good. But we've got four different structures that are going, yes, 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 yes. The pleasure center serves two purposes. It gives a feeling of satisfaction when a need is fulfilled, or even the anticipation that a need will be fulfilled. It gives a surge of relief or intense satisfaction when a pain is diminished. Psychoactive substances activate the pleasure circuit and rewards the individual with a feeling of satisfaction or pain relief. Unfortunately, psychoactive substances overactivate the pleasure center and shut down the stop switch, enabling the individual to feel an intense need to continue use. <clears throat> Three phases of brain activity with a re reward reinforcement pathway. The first is the anticipation of drug use or compulsive behavior uh, creates craving. Internal or external cues activate the amygdala, which causes a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which in turn activates the nucleus accumbens, causing craving. Okay, so just being um, <clears throat> in the vicinity, uh, you, you develop a craving uh, for these drugs. Uh, the neurotransmitter that we're dealing with here, dopamine. For an alcoholic, passing a bar, external cue, would activate the amygdala, causing the release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for alcohol. Just passing a bar, especially a bar that they have gotten drunk in in the past. For someone who smoked pot with their friends before they went away to school, when they see their friends on spring break, that's an external cue, it would activate the amygdala, uh, causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for pot, just seeing their friends. The second phase of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the brain telling the individual to do it again after ingesting the psychoactive substance. With the use, dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area, which activates a nucleus accumbens to continue the craving. <clears throat> Phase three of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the nucleus accumbens signaling the orbitofrontal cortex that it has taken in the substance and asks for a signal of more or satiation. In addicts and abusers, this signal is weakened as the reasoning function of the area resulting in ingestion that does not lead to satiation. Psychoactive substance in, substances imprint the memory of euphoria or pain relief more deeply than most natural survival memories. The alteration of the brain chemistry causes normal activities to be less pleasurable. And this is somebody on cocaine. This is somebody, uh, this is a control uh, with the same activation. As you can see, this is a much stronger, the control has a much stronger um, activation uh, of their brains than the, the individual on cocaine. They can't feel pleasure. They, they need this overstimulation in order to feel pleasure, the person that's on cocaine. To a methamphetamine addict, the desire for the drug will be more important than her relationship with her children. Uh, and there have been cases, uh, there have been cases on the Navajo Nation uh, where an individual sold their children for a fix. They have prostituted their children for a fix. To the compulsive gambler, gambling will become more important to them than food or sex. Psychoactive substances tend to affect the physiological function of the body, especially the heart rate and the respiration, because remember, the heart rate and the respiration take place in the, uh, in the brain stem. And this is what the, uh, this is part of, this is where that reward reinforcement pathway is. It's in the brain stem. Uh, so it goes directly into the brain stem, <clears throat> and that not only makes you feel good, but it also controls your heart rate and your respiration. So if you overdose on, uh, on uh, heroin, uh, then one of the things that may happen to you, even though you're feeling the pleasure, uh, you may get too much of the heroin, 
and it will shut down your heart rate and it will will it will shut down your breathing and it will uh, slow down your heart rate <clears throat> And this can be really serious. Uh, you see this all the time. This is one of the reasons uh, why when somebody overdoses, they bring them into the emergency room, uh, and we look at them, we look at their eyeballs, and one of the things that we're looking for is pinpoint pupils, because on an opiate, uh, your your pupils uh, will, uh, will uh, constrict. And if they constrict, if we see constricted pupils, then we know that they've overdosed and that they are uh, potential, they will potentially uh, go into cardiac arrest, uh, and they were their their respiration will be really shallow. Psychedelics such as LSD and marijuana and the rave drugs not only affect the old brain but the new brain as well. Uh, these drugs especially affect memory as they activate two areas of the brain that help to control memories: the amygdala and the hippocampus. As people age from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, they learn to integrate the drives of the old brain with the reasoning and common sense of the new brain. Developmental problems, childhood traumas such as chaotic or abusive childhoods, compulsive behavior or psychoactive drug use can circumvent survival mechanisms and lead to irrational behavior or addiction. The most important structure of the reward reinforcement, reinforcement pathway is the nucleus accumbens septi. This bundle of nerves is the most powerful reinforcer in the pathway. It is this area of the brain that drives people to action. Research with rats stimulating this area of the brain led to death. They could, not, they could do nothing else but stimulate this area. Human subjects who stimu stimulated the area, the same area, behaved in a similar manner to the rats. So just because you're not a rat doesn't mean that you're not uh, that that you have control over this area. Social factors tend to affect the obsession to use psycho a psychoactive substance. The psychoactive substance alters the brain chemistry to make the individual want to use. This is one reason why only complete abstinence will stop the craving. To begin again will lead to the craving starting at the same intense level. And this is one of the things that happened to Robin Williams. Robin Williams used to be, uh, used to be a cokehead, and then he cleaned himself up, and he became a, uh, instead of just doing comedy, he started doing, doing um, dramatic acting. <clears throat> before he committed suicide, well, he, he committed suicide for a couple different reasons. One of them had to do with the fact that he fell off the wagon and uh, he started using cocaine again. Um, then he found out he had um, um, uh, debilitating Alzheimer's disease and it was, it was um, fast, fast acting and uh, that he didn't have very long to live. So he committed suicide. But he fell off the wagon. We know he fell off the wagon. He went back to rehab. Had to go back to rehab. As soon as he got out, and after he had been diagnosed with, with the Alzheimer's uh, disease, he uh, committed suicide. <clears throat> brain imaging has shown that brain cells change as addiction develops. While normal memory doesn't take place until an action has been repeated three or more times, int intense stimulation can cause sensitization with just one encounter. These neural pathways are highly sensitive and may cause relapse in just one additional encounter. This is one of the reasons why, if you're addicted to a substance, stay away from it. You can't go back and just use it. You can't, if you're an alcoholic, you can't uh, become a... Um, uh, social drinker. It's not going to work. It doesn't work that way. If you start drinking, you're not going to stop. Why do psychoactive drugs disrupt the on-off switches of the reward reinforcement pathway? One theory is that since they don't originate from an essential body need, the brain has no satiation point established for psychoactive substances. When do you stop? Well, there is no natural stopping place. A second theory is that the on-off switch gets stuck in the on position. The person doesn't realize uh, that the act has been completed. The person will use until they run out of drug or pass out. And this guy 
has passed out. A third theory is that the psychoactive drug creates such euphoria or pain relief that the on-off switch is ignored or overridden by the brain. A fourth theory is that the psychoactive substance disrupts communication between the old and the new brains. Many psychoactive substances incapacitate the thinking and reasoning portion of the new brain, and the individual reverts to old brain instincts or automatic functioning. And I don't have any idea how this guy got into the wheel well. Or the... Well, anyway, he's, he's a mess. <laughs> I don't know how he's going to get out. Uh, the main instrument of the nervous system is the neuron, of course. The neuron is composed of the soma, the axon, and the dendrites. We learn this in physiological psych. Information comes into the neuron through the dendrites and is distributed to the other entities through the terminals at the end of the axon. And these are the axon terminals down here. Each neuron can make contact with one entity up to 150,000. It is estimated that there is more than 100 trillion to 500 trillion neuronal connections in the human body, depending on how you were stimulated uh, when you were a child. Did you read a lot? Did you watch a lot of television? Uh, did you do things? Did you think a lot? Uh, if so, then potentially you have uh, up, up to as many as 500 trillion neuronal connections in your, in your brain. Uh, neurons are different lengths from fractions of millimeters to the sciatic nerve that can be a meter long and runs from the heel to the spinal column. Neurons do not touch, but they do communicate with one another. This communication takes place in the synaptic cleft, a gap between the two neurons. In order for the two neurons to communicate, a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter must pass between them. The neurotransmitter is housed in tiny sacs called vesicles. Acetylcholine, a transmitter that activates muscles, it works as a vasodilator, it controls mental acuity, memory, and learning, it decreases with age, causes rapid dementia referred to as Alzheimer's disease. The first neurotransmitter, uh, the first neurotransmitter discovered was acetylcholine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, the second two neurotransmitters discovered, uh, were norepinephrine and epinephrine. It acts as a stimulant uh, when the body demands energy. It controls your hunger. Uh, it controls your attention span, your motivation, your confidence and alertness. Uh, epinephrine uh, uh, increases your energy level. Norepinephrine in increases your confidence and feel feelings of well-being. <clears throat> Dopamine regulates fine motor muscular activity, emotional stability, satiation, reward reinforcement pathway. Dopamine is the most important neurotransmitter involved in drug use. Reduced dopamine leads to Parkinson's disease, where you have tremors and you have a difficult time controlling your legs. Uh, excess dopamine causes schizophrenia, and the reason I have this picture over here is this is an individual who is uh, who suffers from schizophrenia, and he is starting to go into a crisis. And as you can see, the, he drew, when he drew the cat, when he was okay, the cat looked like a cat, and then as he started to go into crisis, the cat got more and more and more bizarre. Schizophrenia. Histamine controls the inflammation of tissue and allergic reactions. It regulates emotional behavior and sleep, and this is one of the reasons why uh, if you have a, an inflammation, uh, one of the things we'll give you is an antihistamine. In other words, we're trying to reduce the amount of, of inflammation that is taking place in your body. So if you have an allergic reaction, we'll give you an anti antihistamine to reduce the swelling. This is what happens with people that have asthma. Their um, alveoli are, are swelling up. Their bronchii are swelling and they're swelling shut so that they can't breathe properly. So we, what we need to do is give them an antihistamine to reduce that swelling. Serotonin controls mood stability, 
Uh, it causes depression, it gives you appetite, uh, it controls your sleep, and it controls your sexual activity. Mood can be elevated by forcing more serotonin into the synaptic cleft. And you may be asking yourself, well, how does it control sexual activity? Humans um, have sex, uh, and the uh, sex drive is, uh, is created by uh, testosterone. Uh, in your hypothalamus, both males and females, and this may tell you why males seem to have a stronger sex drive than, than females do. So it, it's the testosterone in your hypothalamus. Well, how in the world, uh, if we all just had lots and lots of testosterone, it would be a mess. People would be um, uh, wanting to have sex constantly. Uh, so in order to control the testosterone in your, in your hypothalamus, uh, it is controlled by serotonin. So the more serotonin you have in your system, uh, the more uh, the uh, less effect that testosterone has on your on your uh, your your being. <clears throat> okay. So what happens if you uh, uh, if somebody gives you uh, serotonin, a, a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor? Uh, what if somebody gives you a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like? Prozac or Zoloft or Paxil, uh, what if they give you a, a, a pharmaceutical that increases your serotonin level? Well, for some people, it takes away their libido. It takes away their, their sex drive. So serotonin controls your sex drive. Um, most of us have the same amount of testosterone, whether you're, whether you're a male or a female. Most males have the same amount of testosterone. They have this, about the same sex drive. Because if they didn't, of course, they would be oversexed and uh, they'd be, have to be taken out of society. That's one of the reasons why no matter who you are, your sex drive is just about the same as the next guy that, that's coming down the pike. That's just the way it works. Humans are very, we haven't been around for the, all that long. We've only been around for a couple million years. And because of that, we are all very similar, no matter, you know, Race doesn't have a whole lot to do with anything <clears throat> because we're all so similar. Our DNA is so similar. It's not like 99.2% of our DNA is identical. Mine is identical to yours, and yours is identical to the Japanese, and the Japanese are identical to the, the uh, Africans, and the Africans are identical to the Europeans. I mean, it's, we're all 99.2% of our DNA. This is one of the reasons why it's easy, not easy, that's not, that's not a fair assumption. That's why it's, it's not so difficult to check somebody's DNA, because everybody's DNA is, we only have to check 0.8% of the DNA in order to see the differences between one person and the other. <clears throat> Enkephalins, endorphins, and dynorphins. Uh, this is involved in regulation of pain, uh, relief uh, or of uh, stress, immune response, stomach activity, and other physiological functions. It's the endorphins that, uh, that the opiates control. Now, potentially, since opiates don't work on me, it, uh, maybe my endorphins are different than other people's endorphins. Another thing that ha doesn't happen to me is I don't get runner's high. Uh, I can run forever. Well, not really. I wish I could. But uh, even if I run forever, I don't, I don't really get uh, runner's high. And I've been running, you know, most of my life. I ran track in high school and college. <clears throat> and I liked winning, but I guess I, I never got runner's high. Gamma immunobutyric acid, or GABA, uh, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's involved in 25 to 40 percent of all the synapses in the brain. It controls impulses, muscle relaxation, arousal. It slows down the brain. Uh, alcohol has a strong effect on GABA, and this is one of the reasons why alcohol. It's it uh, it inhibits the inhibitory neurotransmitter, and this is one of the reasons why. Uh, when Uncle Charlie uh, gets a little bit drunk, he, he thinks that he can dance. Uh, that's the reason why. Because normally he wouldn't dance because he knows he can't dance. <laughs> but because he's been drinking alcohol, uh, the, the inhibitory aspect of the, uh, 
GABA has been taken out of the the equation, and now Uncle Charlie's dancing with a with a lampshade over his head. As fun as that is, glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's found in the brain stem and the spinal cord. It slows down the brain. It is prominent in protein metabol or synthesis. Glutamic acid, glutamate, glutamine. Uh, they're important excitatory neurotransmitters. They play a, a major role in cognition, in motor function, sensory function, and it reinforces your memory. It's a precursor for GABA, gamma immunobutyric acid. Substance P, the P stands for peptide, not pain, conveys the pain message to the brain from the peripheral nervous system. In Keflin's block, substance P, and that's why um, if you, uh, you're playing soccer, this guy's playing soccer, and potentially he got his nose broken, but he's going to go ahead and, and, and keep playing because the encephalins, uh, or the uh, substance P will block the encephalins at telling him that he's in pain, and he won't even feel it. This is one of the reasons why football players sometimes will dislocate their fingers while, the, while they are playing, uh, because they have adrenaline in their system, and they have uh, substance P, uh, they won't know that they're in pain. And it won't be until they realize it that they start uh, feeling what, it, uh, what has happened to them. Anandamide has an affinity for the receptor sites that accommodate uh, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the uh, psychoactive substance in marijuana. It's found in the limbic system, uh, integration of sensory experiences with emotion, controls learning motor coordination and memory. It acts as an analgesic. For the longest time, we couldn't figure out why THC, why marijuana uh, affected people, why it give you, gave you the munchies, uh, why it controlled pain, why it controlled nausea, why people were goofy happy when they were smoking pot. Couldn't figure any of this out. Didn't make any sense whatsoever. But we hadn't fa we hadn't discovered anandamide yet. And once we discovered anandamide, we realized that uh, that the uh, uh, receptor sites that the THC was inhabiting uh, were were actually anandamide uh, receptor sites. And that's one of the reasons why we understand what marijuana is doing to us today. Whereas you know. Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we had no clue what was going on. And for that reason, people were going, well, it's a natural, it's a natural painkiller. It's a wonderful substance. It's natural. And the, the reality was, no, no, it's not. It's doing what other uh, psychoactive substances are doing. It's inhabiting a uh, receptor site for a neurotransmitter. And now we know. Corticotropin uh, is, what are we talking about? A corticotropin comes from your pituitary gland, and it uh, activates ACTH. Um, Corticotropin-releasing hormone is actually released by the, uh, by the hypothalamus, which controls the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland produces ACTH. ACTH... Um, induces the, uh, the uh, adrenal glands to produce cortisone. It uh, aids in the immune system. It helps healing. It is part of the stress control. Nitric oxide. Since it was discovered in 1992, the functions of nitric oxide just continues to expand. It is necessary for erectile function uh, of the penis. And this is where Viagra came from. Uh, it uh, controls the uh, substance, Viagra controls the substance that keeps you from having an erection all the time. Okay, and that's why it works. Now the person can have an, er uh, an erection. It helps regulate emotions. It, uh, it, in two large dosages, it can cause cancer and vascular collapse. So we don't want too much nitric oxide in our system, or we may have a uh, vascular collapse. Alcohol directly affects GABA, metenkephalin, and serotonin, and that's the reason it does the things that it does. 
Benzo benzodiazepines directly affect GABA and glycine. Marijuana uh, affects anandamide, uh, 2-AG, acetylcholine, and dynorphin. Uh, heroin uh, affects uh, endorphin, uh, enkephalin, and dopamine. LSD affects acetylcholine, dopamine, and serotonin. Nicotine affects uh, epinephrine and endorphin and acetylcholine. Uh, cocaine and amphetamines affect uh, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and ac uh, acetylcholine. MDA and MDMA affect serotonin, uh, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And PCP, phenocyclidine, that's not right. Yeah, phenocyclidine affects uh, dopamine, uh, acetylcholine, and alpha endocytosine. Neurotransmitters attach themselves to receptor cells on the receiving entity, muscles, organs, other neurons, that are chemically structured to only accept that neurotransmitter. However, select receptor sites may have different functions for the same neurotransmitter. There are seven types of serotonin receptors, each of which has a slightly different function. Dopamine has five types of receptors, referred to as D1 through D5. The D2 receptor is a site that is used by most psychoactive substances. Each neuron maintains and transmits only one type of neurotransmitter, except for neurons that transmit epinephrine, which may also transmit norepinephrine. However, a neuron may have receptor sites for any number of neurotransmitters. A neuron is stimulated when it receives enough neurotransmitter to create a chemical imbalance in the neuron that forces sodium and potassium gates to open. The increase of positively charged sodium and potassium ions from outside the neuron and the flooding out of negatively charged chloride ions causes an electrical chain reaction to run down the neuron to the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, the electrical stimulation causes the vesicles to release their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, which in turn stimulates the partner neuron. <clears throat> Excitatory neurotransmitters work by opening sodium gates, allowing sodium into the neuron. Inhibitory neurotransmitters work by opening chloride gates, making the neuron more negative and thus more difficult to stimulate. The stimulation of the neuron by the neurotransmitter is called uh, is known as the first messenger system. If the neuron is stimulated by another entity, such as a biological or chemical change, it is known as a second messenger system, and that's how pharmaceutical, most pharmaceuticals work through the second messenger system. The neurotransmitter can't remain in the synaptic cleft, or the reaction won't stop, so it must be removed. This occurs in one of two ways. The neurotransmitter is chemically broken down, acetylcholine broken down by acetylcholinesterase, uh, and therefore there's not any uh, acetylcholine in the, the uh, synaptic cleft, or the neurotransmitter is taken back to the neuron, and that uh, originally distributed it in a process known as reuptake. And that's how Prozac, Zoloft, and uh, Paxil work. They are selective serotonin, reuptake inhibitors. They inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. And they that forces more serotonin in the into the synaptic cleft. And because there's more serotonin in the synaptic cleft, the person feels less depression. The number of receptor sites is not constant. When the amount of neurotransmitter decreases, the cell will increase the number of receptors so that as, as much neurotransmitter as possible finds a place to attach. And this is known as upregulation. So if the, neuro, if the uh, neuron is looking for a substance, it will increase the number of receptor sites. And this is known as upregulation. If there is too much neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, the number of receptor sites will decrease to prevent overstimulation, and this is known as downregulation. This occurs when someone takes drugs. The individual takes more and more of the drugs, trying to achieve the same reaction as they had originally. Excessive use of drug may cause a permanent downregulation. 
And this is the problem with MDA and MDMA, with ecstasy. Ecstasy overstimulates the serotonin uh, neuron, the neurons that uh, react to serotonin. And because it overstimulates it, the first time you use it, you get, an, you get this amazing reaction. The second time you use it, you don't get as strong a reaction. Why? Because the neurons have downregulated. There aren't as many uh, 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 serotonin receptor sites. Uh, the more you take, the more downregulation that takes place. Eventually, you may kill that, that uh, neuron, or the, the, the neuron will only have a very limited number of uh, receptor sites. So whereas <clears throat> you were looking for all the stimulation because you got it the first time, you're never going to get the same amount of stimulation due to downregulation. Psychoactive drugs work because they act as either agonists or antagonists. Agonists either mimic or facilitate the effect of a neurotransmitter. Nicotine does this with acetylcholine. Uh, alcohol does this with JBA. LSD does this with serotonin. And THC does this with, an, with anandamide. If this happens partially, it is known as a partial agonist. An antagonist blocks the neurotransmitters. If the receptor is stabilized, making it inactive by a drug, the drug is referred to as an inverse agonist. How drugs affect neurotransmitters? They can block the release of neurotransmitters. Heroin blocks the release of substance P. They can force the release of neurotransmitters, forcing more to be released than is released naturally. Cocaine forces the release of norepinephrine and dopamine. Ecstasy, MDMA, forces the release of serotonin. <clears throat> Sorry, I needed a drink. <clears throat> the drugs uh, can prevent the reabsorption of the neurotransmitter. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors block the reuptake of serotonin, elevating the person's mood. The drugs can inhibit an enzyme that helps synthesize the neurotransmitter. <clears throat> Blood pressure medicines inhibit enzymes that allow the production or, or, or of nor, norepinephrine, which would cause the high blood pressure if allowed to be released in the synaptic cleft. So it tries to control norepinephrine. Drugs can inhibit enzymes that break down neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft, allowing the neurotransmitter to remain in the cleft. Methamphetamine inhibits monoamine oxidase and, and catechol o methyltransferase, which break down norepinephrine and epinephrine in the synaptic cleft, putting more of that the epinephrine and norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft. The drug can interfere with the storage of the neurotransmitter. The drug can do a combination of any of these interactions. While some drugs have desired effects, like making the individual resist fatigue or block pain, they can also be dangerous. Cocaine forces the release of norepinephrine and dopamine, which makes the individual not only stay up beyond normal exhaustion, but respond in an overly excited and sometimes violent manner. Heroin blocks uh, pain and creates a euphoric sensation by attaching to receptor sites in the reward reinforcement pathway, but unfortunately also attaches to the breathing center depressing respiration. <clears throat> LSD acts as both a stimulatory neurotransmitter and alters the user's perception of external messages, mixing their perceptions so that they may hear images and see sounds. And this is known as synesthesia. Other psychedelics block the action of acetylcholine, creating hallucinations. The body may deal with drugs in several ways. You may develop tolerance. Uh, you may develop tissue dependence. Uh, you may develop psychological dependence. You may uh, withdraw from the drug. Uh, it may cause withdrawals from the drug. It may break down the drug, create metabolism. Any foreign substance will be treated as a toxin in the body. The liver and the kidneys will try to eliminate it so that it cannot do any damage. If the individual continues to use the substance, the body will adapt to having the drug present. 
This adaptation to the presence of a toxin is called tolerance. <clears throat> tolerance to drugs will force the individual to take more and more of the drug to get the same effect. A methamphetamine user will achieve a certain level of euphoria and energy the first time that they use it. If they use every day for 100 days, by the 100th day, they will have built up a tolerance for the drug that will necessitate a 20 times increase on the amount that they used the first time. In order for tolerance to occur, sometimes the drugs must be taken ir uh, irresponsibly. If the individual is taking Valium at higher doses than the doctor prescribes, or the doctor is prescribing heavy usage of the medication, the tolerance will be accelerated. Research shows that there are individuals who have built up a tolerance to, th to the degree that they were using 100 to 200 times the standard dosage. Tolerance will return to normal if the drug is no longer used. Types of tolerance, dispositional tolerance, the body accelerates the metabolism of the drug by producing more of the enzyme used to metabolize the toxic substance. The more people drink alcohol, the greater their tolerance because of dispositional tolerance. Thus, the individual will have to consume higher levels of alcohol to become intoxicated. Pharmacodynamic tolerance, affected nerve cells become less sensitive to the drug. When opioids are used, neurons begin generating fewer receptor cells to the opioid to lessen its effects. The body will also produce uh, cholecystokinin as an antagonist to the drug. Cholecystokinin comes out of your gallbladder. If you've had gall your gallbladder removed, you don't have any cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is produced for a lot of different reasons, but one big one is to break down fats. So if you've had your gallbladder removed and you consume a lot of fats, then it changes your bowel movements. Gives you diarrhea. <clears throat> so doctors should be telling you if you don't have a gallbladder that you need to uh, cut back on your fats. Uh, behavioral tolerance, the brain compensates for the effects of the drug by using parts of the brain not affected. A person who is drunk can force themselves to appear sober when necessary. Reverse tolerance, as the drug destroys tissue, the user becomes more sensitive to the drug and can tolerate less and less of the substance. This happens to alcoholics who suffer from cirrhosis of the liver. Since the liver doesn't work as well, a little alcohol will get them drunk because the liver is, is not operational enough to metabolize the alcohol. Acute tolerance, a tachyphylaxis, uh, the brain and body adapt instantly to the toxic effects of the drug. Tolerance to, to tobacco occurs this way. People who try to commit suicide using barbiturates may experience the same instant tolerance and survive twice the lethal dosage. LSD will not work if two doses are taken close together due to toxiphylaxis. And the same thing happened, well, we're going to talk about uh, with cocaine. If you snort cocaine, it's a vasoconstrictor, and so it, it closes up those blood vessels. And now if you snort cocaine again, it won't go anywhere because it can't get into your blood vessels. They're all constricted. Uh, select tolerance. The body develops uh, tolerance to mental and physical effects at uh, different rates. Uh, this occurs with opiates and sedatives. With barbiturates, sleep will be induced long after the euphoric effect is no longer present. Inverse tolerance, or kindling. Uh, the brain chemistry changes so that the person becomes more sensitive to the effects of the drug. With continued use, cocaine and marijuana users will get a minimal effect and then after months we'll start to get an intense reaction. In the case of cocaine, it may cause heart attack or stroke. So you've been snorting cocaine for an extended length of time. Uh, now all of a sudden you die of a heart attack. Why has this happened? You've been using the same amount. Why is this happening? Because you have a different reaction. And this is known as inverse tolerance. Uh, cross tolerance, if a person develops a tolerance for one drug in a family of drugs, they will be tolerant of other drugs in that family. The opioid family is this way. 
Tolerance to heroin will make the person equally tolerant of morphine, codeine, or methadone. A person tolerant of Xanax will be tolerant to other benzodiazepines and even the depressant alcohol. A person tolerant to barbiturates will be tolerant to benzodiazepines. Tissue dependence. This is the biological change of the body to adapt to the presence of the drug. This usually occurs after prolonged use. Allostasis uh, sometimes will occur where the tissues and the organs of the body depend on the drug to be functional. In these circumstances, cessation of the drug usage will cause dangerous and dramatic withdrawals. In select circumstances, cross-dependence will occur where dependence of one drug can be alleviated with another drug. Psychological dependence, addiction used to, mean, used to mean that the person taking the drug was tissue dependent on the drug. With continued research in brain imaging technology, it has been recognized that psychological dependence is an important factor in addictive behavior. The altered states of consciousness that are caused by select drugs can lead to continued misuse to avoid life's problems. It is, known, it is now acknowledged that psychological dependence occurs before tissue dependence and that the response rate from either is similar. Psychological factors that induce reinforcement, drug automiz, autom, automatism, uh, the individual uses the drug aimlessly, unconsciously, and repetitively, negative reinforcement, unpleasant states encourage drug usage, smokers will wake up in the middle of the night to smoke, to dissipate nicotine withdrawals. Social reinforcement, peer pressure, and the need for social inclusion encourages continued use. Physiological responses to drugs, uh, the opioid effects. Um, opioids cause numbness, euphoria, dryness of mouth, uh, constipation, decreased pulse, low blood pressure, shallow breathing, and inability to cough, pinpoint pupils, and malaise. Withdrawal symptoms from opioid substance are substances uh, is the opposite. Tactile reaction is that you feel pain. The psychological reaction, anxiety and depression or craving. The physical excretory reaction, sweating and you stink like a dog. I'll tell you what, it's, this is really nasty stuff. Runny nose, tearing, increased salivation. Digestive tract reaction, uh, you have diarrhea instead of constipation. Uh, circulatory reaction, hypertension. Uh, respiratory reaction, excessive coughing. Uh, optic reaction, dilated pupils. Remember the pinpoint pupils. This is one of the ways that we can, uh, that we can uh, uh, detect uh, an opioid uh, over, uh, overdose is the pinpoint pupils. Muscular reaction, severe hyperreflexes, and muscle cramps. People rarely die from an opioid substance withdrawals. <clears throat> Hardly ever happens. However, people do die from alcohol withdrawals. So we'll go into that later. Drug withdrawal is the body's attempt to rebalance itself after cessation of prolonged use of psychoactive substances. Many times for a chronic user, fear of withdrawal is one of the reasons for continued use. Withdrawal often entails muscle aches, pain, insomnia, vomiting, cramps, and on occasion convulsions. And it's usually the convulsions that kill people. Non-purposive withdrawal, visible physical signs due to tissue dependence such as seizure, sweating, goosebumps, or crawling flesh, vomiting, diarrhea, and tremors. Purposive withdrawal, expectation of withdrawal symptoms causing the rationalization of continued use of psychoactive substance. Withdrawal effects can be observed whether there is tissue dependence or not. Protracted withdrawal, heavy craving for the drug even after the, the addict has been detoxified. This is usually caused from an external cue that causes the subject to have flashbacks to use and withdrawal symptoms. This often causes a recovering addict to relapse. Post-acute withdrawal symptoms, uh, persistent emotional and physical problems that last from three to six months after recovery. 
unclear thinking and cognitive impairment, memory problems, emotional overreaction, sleep disturbances, motor coordination, dizziness problems, difficult managing stress, craving the drug. Sometimes drug abuse is a symptom of other underlying problems. When this is the case, the user will sometimes seek the desired effect by experimenting with drug usage. Replacement uh, will replace the desired drug with another intoxicant. Multiple drug use, use of different drugs to alleviate different symptoms. Cycling, using a drug intensely for a period of time and then abstaining, abstaining to lower your tolerance or allow the body to repair. Cycling is what killed Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse was an alcoholic. She used a lot of drugs, but she was an alcoholic. And so she had uh, gone off of alcohol for about six weeks. When she, when she started drinking again, her tolerance level had, had, uh, uh, had lowered. And because of that, she drank as much as she normally did when she had built up a tolerance to it. And this time it killed her. And that's one of the reasons why I show you pictures of Amy Winehouse. She died at 27. Um, she's one of the more notorious um, drug users. Stacking, using two or more similar drugs at the same time to achieve a specific effect. Uh, mixing, using drug combinations to acquire a new effect. Uh, Speedballs are a mixture of cocaine and heroin. Marijuana laced with cocaine, uh, ecstasy and LSD known as X and L. Uh, methadone and clonopin uh, mimics heroin. So you can mix your drugs and get a different reaction. Sequentialing, uh, going from one ad addiction to the other. This can either refer to drug sequentialing, drug replaced by a compulsive behavior, or one compulsive behavior replacing another. I had a friend... Uh, uh, up in Montana, uh, who was an alcoholic for like 17 years, went off of alcohol, detoxified, and all of a sudden became a, a compulsive gambler. So he had replaced one addictive behavior with another. But of course, uh, gambling usually won't kill you, but uh, uh, alcoholism will. The problem was that uh, he was the type of gambler that would... Uh, had to gamble all of his money away. Uh, in other words, he would, uh, if he were on a roll and he kept winning, uh, he would uh, accumulate all of his winnings, and then he would he would uh, gamble until all that was gone. Uh, so he couldn't leave the table without being at rock bottom, having no money at all. Morphing, uh, using one drug to counteract another. Uh, a cocaine user may drink alcohol to come down. Uh, you, you may use coffee. That's what we try to get people. That's one of the old saws. You use coffee. Uh, if somebody's drunk, get, feed them coffee. The caffeine, of course, uh, will uh, counteract the uh, alcohol. Using methamphetamine to function during a heroin high. Uh, level of use is determined by the amount used. Frequency of use. Length of time psychoactive substances have been used. The impact the drug usage has on the user's life. Categories of usage include abstinence, experimentation, social reactional uh, use, habituation, uh, abuse, and addiction. Many individuals cannot choose their level of drug use, but are at the mercy of the psychoactive properties of the drug being used. Abstinence means that an individual does not use any psychoactive substances except accidentally. Even if the person has a strong hereditary or environmental susceptibility for compulsive drug use, they never start, and they, uh, therefore they never get hooked. These individuals might display other compulsive behaviors such as gambling, overeating, compulsive internet use, and excessive sexual behavior. Research shows that individuals who wait until they are 18 years of age to experiment with, with alcohol 
nicotine or marijuana are less likely to use these substances as gateway drugs for more dangerous substances such as cocaine or heroin. However, if the individual experiments between the ages of 10 and 12, they're more likely to use the early experimentation as a gateway to more serious usage. Individuals who don't start smoking until age 21 are very unlikely to develop an addiction to nicotine. Anyone who doesn't try an addictive substance until age 21 will probably not become an addict. Experimentation uh, with psychoactive substances uh, occurs because of curiosity, but no pattern of usage is developed and there are no negative consequences from the experiment experimentation unless usage leads to injury, accident, or illness, the individual has an exaggerated reaction, a pre-existing physical or mental condition is exacerbated. The user is pregnant. Nothing is good for somebody that's pregnant. They can't do anything. Any of these toxins will become toxins to the baby. The individual is arrested for use. Heredity or environment dictates addiction. Previous addiction with other substances leads to relapse. Social recreational use. Social recreational users may seek out a drug for the effect, but no permanent pattern of use is developed. Usage can be controlled for these individuals as long as they do not develop drug-seeking behavior. Habituation, the individual has developed a pattern of usage, but there has been no negative effects on the individual's life. This is referred to as, as habituation because, though there is no increase of usage, the usage pattern indicates that there is a def definite craving for the substance. Abuse. The individual continues to use the substance despite the negative life consequences that have occurred. These consequences can be personal, such as relationships, uh, breaking up, uh, problems in their social lives, uh, financial, legal, continued use despite arrest for possession, medical, personal health, uh, alcoholic with diabetes, heavy smoker with emphysema, the cocaine user with hypertension, work or social related, emotional stability, uh, LSD users with mental instability. Addiction. The difference between abuse and addiction is the compulsive behavior of the addict. Addiction is a classification if the individual has no control over duration of usage or the amount used. The individual has been unsuccessful at control. They spend an inordinate amount of time ob obtaining drugs or recovering from usage. They limit social, occupational, or recreational activities for use. They continue use despite physical, social, relationship, or psychological problems. They use in the morning for a jump start on the day. They defend their drug usage with anger or even rage. They experience withdrawal when unable to use the drug. They must increase the amount used uh, to obtain the desired effect. I have a friend from uh, f that I grew up with uh, in uh, in Indiana, <clears throat> and uh, he was uh, he was adopted, but he was an only child in in this uh, in this family. Um, they owned farms, they owned fields, they owned a house, they owned a barn, they owned about six hundred acres, and each. Each field was, uh, in, in Indiana, um, most of these people um, uh, had 40-acre fields. They would have a 40-acre field here and a 40-acre field there. And anyway, this guy, this guy uh, uh, kept getting into trouble. He uh, kept using marijuana. Uh, lots of problems, just tons of problems. And so uh, he, would need, he would need more, more drugs. And he would sell off a field, then he'd sell off another one, then he'd sell off another one. Uh, he'd get into trouble, and and uh, um, he didn't. They wouldn't give him car insurance, so you know he'd be in a wreck because he was stoned. And of course, he'd have to. The only way he could pay for it, uh, the uh, uh, the damage was to sell another field. Eventually, he lost the whole farm. He lost all six hundred acres. Um, he lost his house. He lost his barn. Uh, he had to put his mother in a uh, nursing home. And uh, I think he's still alive. I haven't heard that he died. Uh, but all he does all day is look for more pot. That's all he does. Uh, so, and he claims that, that you can't get 
become addicted to marijuana because it's not addictive. Well, I would say he is because that's all he does. He tries to procure more drugs. Marijuana is not legal in Indiana. So he's been under the radar for an extended length of time. Can't, can't hold a job because he's, you know, he has to find his pot. Addiction comprises the four C's. Control, loss thereof, compulsive use of the drug, craving the drugs, and continued use of the drugs. Loss of control, compulsive, craving, and continued use of the drugs. The American Psychiatric Association has identified substance use as a mental illness since the printing of the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1950. Two, the current DSM-5 divides substance abuse disorders into two general categories, substance-related disorders and substance-addictive disorders. So substance-related disorders would be for anybody uh, except for the individual that was addicted. That would be uh, the social drinker uh, uh, right up to uh, the addicted person. The DSM-5 deals with several drugs, which include alcohol stimulants, cannabis, or which is marijuana, cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, can, uh, opioids, uh, anxiolytics, which are anti-anxiety drugs, uh, sedatives, uh, sedatives are the barbiturates, uh, benzodiazepines, uh, hypnotics, which are the uh, medications that put you to sleep, uh, caffeine, and tobacco. The addictive disease model, this model of addiction, sees addiction from the medical point of view. Uh, that addiction is a, it sees addiction as a disease. It's chronic, it's progressive, it's relapsing, uh, it's incurable, and it's potentially fatal. This model assumes that the addiction is caused from genetic irregularities in brain chemistry and anatomy that are triggered by certain drugs. Research shows that heredity influences drug use and addiction as much as 40 to 60 percent. So if you have addiction in your family, the best thing to do is stay away from anything that can potentially be addictive. This is one of the problems that uh, my uh, great-great-nephew is going to have. He was addicted to heroin when he was born. Now he needs to stay away from anything that he can become addicted to. And if he doesn't, then he, it's going to be a pattern of, of uh, compulsive use uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, compulsive drug use, uh, the addictive disease model has compulsive drug use with prolonged intoxication with a need to continue use, the inability to control the use, the inability to stop use despite physical, mental, or social problems, repeated attempts to control use, increase intake over time, it's incurable, and the pathological reactions such as blackouts or dramatic personality changes are there. <clears throat> so that's the disease model. The behavior environmental model, this theory purports that negative environmental factors such as abuse, anger, and peer pressure may cause people to seek, use, and sustain a dependence on substances. This model emphasizes the progressive nature of the six levels of drug use, Abstinence, experimentation, social recreational use, habituation, abuse, and then finally addiction. The academic model, uh, the addiction occurs when the body adapts to the toxic effects of the drugs at a biochemical and cellular level. Natural balance has been thrown off, causing four physiological changes. Tolerance, tissue dependence, withdrawal syndrome, and psychological dependence. The diathesis stress model, this model was first developed to explain the causes of schizophrenia. It is a combination of the addictive disease model and the behavioral environmental model. Diathesis means a predisposition or vulnerability to, and in this case, the individual may have a genetic and environmental predisposition to drug addiction. Stress triggers the drug need, and the stronger the diathesis, the more likely the individual will drift into addiction. Heredity, researchers have found that genetics does influence addiction, but there are over 100 genes that have something to do with drug abuse. Uh, it could have something to do with receptors, gene transcription factors, 
enzymes, neuropeptides, G proteins, transporters. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to pinpoint which, which uh, gene causes this problem. Looking at twin studies, Goodman found that of identical twins separated at birth, they were more likely to choose the addiction or abstinence patterns of their biological parents over their adoptive, of, over their adoptive parents. Similar research found that 61% of the sample uh, maintained nicotine dependence, similar to their biological parents, and 55% displayed the same alcohol dependence of their parents, their biological parents. Researchers looking at males in treatment found that children with one alcoholic parent had a 34% greater probability of being an alcoholic than the male children of a non-alcoholic. When both parents were alcoholics, the child had a 400% probability of being an alcoholic. That is, they have a times four possibility of being an alcoholic. If both parents and a grandfather were alcoholics, the individual had a 900% greater probability of being an alcoholic. There are 28 million Americans who have one parent who is an alcoholic. So these people need to stay away from alcohol. Researchers have found that 70% of severe alcoholics have a dopamine control gene called DRD2A1. And we're going to talk about DRD2A1 a lot because DRD2A1 makes you do a lot of interesting things. Among social drinkers, only 30% have DRD2A1 gene. When this gene is present, the individual has fewer dopamine receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens. Since many of the missing sites are D2 sites, the individual will need more intense stimulation to feel satisfaction. So they need more stimulation. And for that reason, they, they use more of the toxic substances, alcohol, nicotine, uh, heroin, cocaine. They need more stimulation to feel satisfaction. The DRD2A1 gene seems to indicate the tendency for any problem behavior as it has been found in other addictive behaviors other than alcoholism, gambling, ADHD, aberrant sex sexual behavior, overeating, antisocial personality disorder, and Tourette's syndrome. Some refer to this gene as a compulsivity gene and the process as the reward deficiency syndrome. People with DRD2A1 tend to consume large quantities of psychoactive substances before becoming intoxicated and then have greater dysfunction when they do get drunk, such as blackouts and brownouts. There are also genes that make it less likely that a person will develop an addiction. DRD4 gives the individual an excess dopamine, which has been shown to play a role in spiritual acceptance making it less likely that the individual will accept the addictive lifestyle. Interactions with the environment, but especially the home environment, make new nerve cell connections and alter the neurochemistry that the individual was born with, determining if and how the individual will use psychoactive drugs. Factors in the environment, the, effect, the physical, sexual, emotional abuse that might potentially happen, stress, how much love were you given as a child? Uh, did you live in poverty? Uh, the living conditions that you, uh, that you sustained, family relationships, nutritional balance, health care, neighborhood safety, school quality, peer pressure, the internet, television, all of these things are environmental factors that we have to look at. The environment molds the brain's architecture and neurochemistry determining how the individual will react to outside influences. This is especially true in the first 10 years of life. The brain develops from the front to the back, meaning that adolescents are more prone to more impulse control behaviors, such like just like uh, substance abuse. Recent research shows that it takes at least 20 years for the brain to become hardwired, and the prefrontal lobe continues to grow until around the 44th year. Most people don't become adult, don't have an adult brain until their middle 20s. So they, th that's when it becomes um, permanent. 
That's when you're that, and that's one of the reasons why you're so goofy when you're in high school, 18 years old, 17 years old, you want to be just like everybody else. And then all of a sudden, when you're in your middle 20s, it doesn't matter anymore. You become your own person. Memories are established through a network of neurons involving select neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, uh, serotonin, acetylcholine, and dopamine. The more an action is repeated, the more likely the individual will, will remember it, unless the memory is emotionally intense, in which case the memory has a stronger memory network. Hence the intrusive memories of a traumatic event that may end up causing post-traumatic stress disorder. Children growing up in a chaotic environment where there is excessive emotional pain can deal with the pain in several ways. They can face the pain and try to deal with it. They can find people to help them deal with it. They can accept what happened. They can run away. They can become hyperactive. They can become angry and fight. They can make jokes. They can develop an addictive use with drugs, food, gambling, or sex. If the stress continues over time, the counterbalancing behavior will become ingrained in the brain and becomes part of the individual's personality. In the future, when an unwanted emotion arises, they will be drawn to the simplest solution, the counterbalancing behavior. The people most likely to abuse drugs, stress is common in the home. Abuse of some kind occurs in the home. Drugs or drinking are commonly used in the home or among the individual's peers. Healthy ways of reacting to stress and or anger aren't learned. Society tells the individual that individuals that psychoactive substances are normal and an acceptable way to solve life's problems. Living in a community where access to legal and illegal drugs are easy, there are pre-existing mental conditions exacerbated by the negative home environment. Healthy brain chemistry can't be maintained because of poor nutrition. The media inundates the individual with advertisements supporting the use of select psychoactive substances. One belongs to a peer group where excessive use of psychoactive substances is normal. Heredity in the environment may prime an individual for addictive behavior, but it is a psychoactive substance that they decide to use that will determine the impact the addiction will have on their life. Excessive drug use will not only make the individual more susceptible to more and more use, but more vulnerable to other stronger drugs. Select psychoactive substances, particularly methamphetamine, cause the death of brain cells through a process known as apoptosis, where the damaged cells are programmed to kill themselves. Psychoactive drugs, nicotine, produces an immediate and long-term change in the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, which leads to faster development of tolerance and dependence. Some drugs have a greater power to positively reinforce and therefore compel to a continued use. And this is the, the, the uh, case with cocaine and heroin. Compulsive behavior, uh, compulsive obsessive behavior mimics drug use, which in turn causes the brain to be rewired. This is the way it is with gambling, eating, shopping, sexual activity, video games, and internet use. Research with video game usage has shown that dopamine is released in the reward reinforcement pathway when an individual plays video games, an amount equivalent to methamphetamine usage. Compulsive behavior, PET scans of compulsive eaters, has demonstrated that there is a decreased number of dopamine receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens. Research shows that between 25 and 63% of compulsive gamblers have been dependent on alcohol or other drugs in their lives. It has been demonstrated that gambling creates brain disruption similar to the drug or, uh, or alcohol usage. The drug that pushes the individual hardest and quickest into addiction is smoking nicotine in tobacco. The drug that pushes the individual second hardest and quickest into addiction is smoking crack cocaine. The drug that pushes the individual the third hardest and quickest into addiction is smoking or injecting heroin. 
The drug that pushes the individual the fourth hardest and quickest into addiction is injecting methamphetamines. The drug that pushes the individual the fifth hardest and quickest into addiction is snorting cocaine. The drug that pushes the individual the sixth hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting opioid painkillers. The drug that pushes the individual the seventh hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting any amphetamine. The drug that pushes the individual the eighth hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting sedative hypnotics. The drug that pushes the individual the ninth hardest and quickest into addiction is drinking alcohol. The drug that pushes the individual the tenth hardest and quickest into addiction is smoking marijuana. The drug that pushes the individual the eleventh hardest and quickest into addi addiction is ingesting PCP, phenocyclidine. The drug that pushes the individual the twelfth hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting caffeine. And this is one of the reasons, that's twelfth hardest, my goodness, the twelfth fastest. This is one of the reasons why we don't really worry about caffeine that much, unless you're my brother, of course. The drug that pushes the individual the 13th hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting MDMA, or ecstasy. The drug that pushes the individual the 14th hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting LSD. The drug that pushes the individual the 15th hardest and quickest into addiction is ingesting peyote. And that is the end of the chapter. So, I'll talk to you guys, uh, I think, in a couple of weeks. I'd, I think it, it's going to take a couple weeks. Uh, we deal with this chapter two for a couple weeks.